Dr. Mandu Hai Buyandal Gur um, has a bachelor's and a master's from the National University of Mongolia. Um, and she followed that with a PhD from Harvard in social anthropology. Since 2008, she's been teaching at MIT, where she's currently an associate professor in the Department of Anthropology. Um, her first book was entitled Tragic Spirits, Shamanism, Gender, and Memory in Contemporary Mongolia. It came out in 2013 from the University of Chicago Press. Um, and it was the recipient of the Shu Prize um, for the Society of East Asian Anthropology and the Long Lists International Convention of Asia Scholars Book Prize. And it really deserves it. It's a very good read. It's entertaining. And it's a really, really interesting um, analysis of uh, the collapse of the socialist state in Mongolia and the revival of shamanistic practices there. Uh, throughout her work, she's been focusing on the dynamic interplay of culture, history, regional, and global economic shifts and social configurations in contemporary Mongolia. And today, we get to hear about the particular processes of the neoliberal state formation in this post-socialist political and social landscape, and particularly um, with uh, a focus on gender and women political candidates and women in the political process. Um, I'm really excited to hear the talk. And I'd like you to join me in welcoming um, Dr. Um, Buyan Delger. Uh, thank you very much for um, inviting me. I especially thank Dr. Frank Billet. I also thank everyone um, who put together the Mongolia Initiative, a true achievement in the history of Mongolia scholarship. I hope that it will continue and it will expand. Thank you all also for coming to my talk. I am delighted and honored to be here. One is electionization, which I hope to build into a framework that will expand an understanding of the new subjects and subjectivities in Mongolia today. And two, I will be unpacking the transformation of women as new political subjects in the context of electionization. Much of my fieldwork and analysis centers on the elections of 2008 and 2012 and less on the recent election of 2016, um, partly because if I keep going every four years, I will never finish the book. This means I will take at least some of you down memory lane. So what does the word electionization mean? Why am I discussing it? And how does electionization relate to women candidates in the country's parliamentary elections and beyond? Let me begin this talk by describing my encounter with this neologism, electionization, as an entry point and as a way of situating everyone in the ethnographic context of this presentation. It was spring of 2008. I was traveling from one of the northern provinces back to Ulaanbaatar after observing the week-long work of two campaign managers. As we were leaving the town center in a Toyota SUV, I took a mental note of various candidates' portraits that were erected in the town's uh, shop fronts, market entrances, and on the walls of apartment buildings, and on the billboards along the intercity highway at which we eventually arrived. I just have examples of those posters, not from that day, because I can't find exact um, those exact posters, but these are just to give you an idea what the po political posters look like and the intensity and sort of crowdedness of them on this one especially. Uh, our topic of conversation in the car was, not surprisingly, electoral campaigns, strategies for attracting voters, election fraud, prevention of fraud, the voters' SMS messages to the candidates' cell phones, requesting favors and services, as well as candidates' use of SMS messages to plead for votes. During the journey, we stopped for a meal in a roadside restaurant. The first thing that I saw was a giant portrait of a candidate on the wall of the, of the restaurant building. As we ate, surrounded by walls covered with portraits of the electoral candidates, we watched endless campaign advertisements on the TV. When we left the restaurant, I overheard a heated debate about whether cash promises to citizens made by the two major competing political parties, the, MP the MPRP's promise of a motherland gift, 
to individual citizens um, in the sum of 1,250 US dollars, and the Democratic Party's treasure share, it's um, of one um, of one million two, two Greeks, that equals 833 US dollars, were useful or should have been spent differently, perhaps on the country's infrastructure, on improving outdated educational and medical facilities. When we got back in the car, I mentioned that I was surprised at how everyone seemed to be invested in the electoral campaigns and that the activities and conversations around us all seemed to be about elections and nothing else, even in far-flung parts of the country. One of the political consultants instantly replied in an emphatic fashion. I know, it is a complete madness, is it not? I presume in the United States or in most other places, people hardly electionize. Like us. People elsewhere probably just carry on their daily lives while elections take place the way they are supposed to take place without overwhelming every single person like here. We here electionize as a nation. He said the word Songul somewhat mischievously, stretching the last set of R's for emphasis, perhaps because he was pleased with his neologism. I thought that the word Songul quite aptly caught the current state of affairs in the country. I adopt and adapt the word electionization in order to describe the saturation of images, sounds, and paraphernalia that create particular political sentiments and structures, but also to name the pain production that come to govern Mongolia in times of election as well as during non-election periods. As I have examined the nuances of electoral politics, gender issues, campaign activities, financing, interpersonal relations, and specifically the ways election Elections affected people of all walks of life, from individuals on welfare to the richest Mongolians, I have come to witness that electionization is a process far deeper than the euphoria that I saw in the episodes like the one I reported above. With the concept of electionization, I want to convey that elections do much more than bring new or existing elites to the political power. They define post-socialist Mongolian social life itself. Electionization thus, um, first of all, is a transformation of surfaces. The physical spaces that people inhabit, occupy, come across, and touch on an on everyday ba basis. Surfaces are by no means superficial. The campaign images make their way into personal and private spaces through candidates' gifts like wall clocks, calendars, TV manuals, posters, coffee mugs, brochures, and pamphlets, children's toys, toilet papers, and of course, social media, mobile phones, loudspeakers on the street, and the campaign agitators banging on your apartment doors to distribute the pamphlets and messages. The campaign billboards and other surfaces with the candidates' portraits have a special place in this surface. Unlike artistic images that strive for what Maurizio Lazzaratto calls, quote, multi-referentiality and polyvocality, end of quote, the political posters produce quote, invariance and univocality, end of quote. As political consultants in Mongolia told me, political posters must not yield to interpretations, multiple meanings and misreadings. The endless circulating surface that rolls from walls to pickets when walls end, to screens, to streets, to voices, note the microphone there, and the bodies of hired campaign workers constitute a predatory collection of images, sounds, and signifiers. Electionization is also about the transformation of time. Campaigns, posters, meetings, and media seem to gather the entire country into a single synchronous political moment, one that obliterates the time lag that usually characterizes flows of information from center to periphery, from city to country. The usually delayed access to information and goods on the periphery has long been a source of regional anxiety, one that perpetuates a sense of being left behind. During this non-electoral period, time feels linear, similar to what anthropologist Carol Greenhouse has glossed as Marxian time as history. 
During the election campaigns, on the other hand, people even in the most remote parts of the country now seems to be on the same social time. The experiences of time in Mongolia come closer to a Durkheimian sense of time as a collective representation of social experiences, which is characterized by social rhythms of cyclicality that produce an aura of social cohesion without consensus, marked by Durkheimian collective effervescence. Yet this temporal synchronicity is only one dimension of the ways in which electionization affects time. Time can also be slowed down or halted altogether. Elections bring disruption and risks for individuals employed in government and even in the private sector because with each power shift, basically almost every four years, jobs and resources are reassigned from the affiliates of one political party to those of another. Many professional positions in Mongolia can be seen in the language of U.S. politics as political appointments that also command direct power over the positions below them. This top-down system also integrates selectively kinship and regional affiliations. The cyclic Cyclical instability and uncertainty due to electionization adds to the already existing globally shared uncertainties, fluctuations, and shocks caused by the changing marketplaces of neoliberal capitalism. Many scholars have written about how neoliberal capitalism conditions certain kinds of subjects to meet the demands of constant volatility and insecurity. Mongolians today are experiencing not only the globally shared, to borrow Stuart Hall's famous words, structures of feelings that are today associated with neoliberal capitalism, such as economic anxiety, uncertainty, and the pressure to constantly remake oneself and be ready to accommodate and re-accommodate markets fluctuations. Electionization accelerates this swirl of neoliberal conditions, adding more encouragement for individuals to suspend and strategize their actions and reinvent themselves. In the past, during the year before elections, many businesses and ordinary people tended to become passive and protective as they waited and watched for political developments that might dramatically affect their livelihoods. This kind of caution led to the stagnation of everyday life and the general slowdown in economic and social activity. Along with stagnation of the regular economy, however, elections generate transactions of a different nature. It is as if a special kind of economy, one based on political campaigns, takes over. Think here of the traveling free dental clinic in the nomadic countryside that was run by one candidate. Of candidate-initiated projects to fix the roads right before election day, or of campaigns that organize free foreign language classes. The services that many individual candidates provide are ad hoc, fluid, discrete, disconnected, and have no coordination with each other. As a form of contingent governing, electionization makes legible a phenomenon that is somewhat new to the people of former socialist countries. The economic impact of electionization is vast. It is not just what the parties and candidates dispense to the voters or what private and public monies they spend in order to gain popularity, but also what they create as an outcome of their campaigns. They employ fleets of media professionals, establish research and polling companies, and originate NGOs and NGO-like centers to carry out activities that add to their popularity outside the legally permitted campaign period. About 70% of Mongolia's existing TV channels were created as a part of electoral candidates' campaign infrastructure. By an informal and rough estimate, Overall, national campaign spending for the 2012 parliamentary election was equal to nearly 80% of the country's GDP. Many transaction were, transactions were informal and undocumented and undocumentable, such as bartering condos for consulting services, sponsoring talent shows in local schools, or organizing a Lunar New Year festival for the district's elderly. The high expenditures of the 2012 campaign were also related to the development of the mining industry, which is a topic beyond this talk. Overall, electionization goes beyond the formal campaigns to include all the activities that take place with elections in mind.
Because many electoral campaigns have evolved into multifaceted and ongoing processes beyond the allotted time for campaigning, they employ many individuals from the lowest economic strata to the newly rich and powerful in various short-term projects and activities, which just happens to coincide with the neoliberal employment model. While some work as campaign pamphlet distributors for a half sandwich a day, others, such as campaign advisors, command compensations in the tens of thousands of dollars and more. As I have tried to convey here, elections have been extended far beyond their original purpose, uh, lasting almost entire four years between the elections, becoming perpetual process of campaigning and competition and creating long-term outcomes and influences along the way, producing material items and cultural practices and taking on economic and governing functions. Electionization transforms people's perceptions and regulations of time, money, and infrastructural life, shapes subjects and subjectivities, structures, agency, and worldviews, and creates new classes and other social identities and forms. Electionization has become sustainable, perhaps paradoxically, because it nests inside of and on top of existing relations and state governing practices, while also creating new and pragmatic outcomes not only for winners but almost all participants in this logic. For that, it is fair to say that instead of the nation staging elections, elections stage or run the country. In illustrating how campaigns take on lives of their own and begin to substitute for state functions and then to create and dominate social and communal lives, I pay particular attention to the effects of these processes on women candidates. Electionization can lead to roles for women that are simultaneously empowering as well as indeed more often quite precarious. Who are these women candidates? They are a heterogeneous group that challenges the more established notion of politicians as the elites of the society. Just an example, this was in 2012 when the um, Civil Movement Party just sort of decided to um, nominate 99% of its candidates as women. Um, so, and this very well-known poster in Mongolia. And then this is um, a meeting back in 2012 uh, with uh, Hillary Clinton during Women's Leadership Forum. These are the elected ones. These are the, some of the candidates. This is the elected one. Including both women who came to, of age during socialism and women whose worldviews formed after the collapse of socialism, these candidates come from a variety of regions and class backgrounds. Perhaps the only consistent feature that these women and male candidates as well share is a university education. They are all high-ranking professionals in their respective fields, which range from media, teaching, research, and political party administration to law, engineering, the NGO sector, and entrepreneurship. Another feature that they share is that many of them have been active in the public arena, especially under socialism, when they served as class captains in their schools, heads of their school or district level divisions of the young pioneers or revolutionary youth leagues. Later on, some of these women became active in what was then the only political party, the Mongolian People's Revolutionary Party. It is through these state-organized children's and youth organizations that most of these women honed their political skills, like public speaking and networking, and gain the sense of themselves as public figures. Moreover, beginning in the 1970s, at least 25% of all seats in the National Assembly were reserved for women. The fact that these women took for granted their leadership, organizational, and public roles was a legacy of the Mongolian Women's Committee and the Socialist State that endorsed its policies and programs. I will talk about the complex relationship between the state and women tomorrow, but for now, I want to emphasize the persistent legacies of socialist policies regarding women and how the current crop of new women candidates is not purely a, pro uh, a product of recent democratization, West westernization, and neoliberal capitalism. These candidates com combine legacy and innovation in their own distinct ways. Let me 
dwell a bit longer on the legacies of socialist feminism in order to make two additional points, short points, I promise. One, some, one, some of the political science literature in the United States explains the dearth of women in US politics as a consequence of a lack of so-called political will among women. By endorsing the organized invo um, involvement of women in political life, I emphasize that this so-called political will is not just a matter of individual strength, but is also a product of sponsored organizing of women. My second point is anti-Orientalist. As Kristen Gutsy, an anthropologist of East Central Europe, has noted, Western feminists tend to ignore and even discredit the achievements of women in the former socialist bloc. The reason is largely ideological, as she explains, and stems from biases in cult inculcated during the Cold War period. Many Western feminists are convinced that the empowerment of women under socialism was not empowerment in any actual sense, but rather an indication that these women were mere servants of the state. Kristen Gutsy critiques this line of thought and brings up, quite appropriately, the work of Saba Mahmoud. Western feminists, Mahmoud argues, often conflate agency with freedom. Her case is women's engagement in the Islamic revival in Egypt. According to Mahmoud, we need to we need not demand that all women have canonical liberal agency and free will in order to understand their practices as serving women's needs and desires. This theory, which suggests that women's agency can be realized within a larger framework, is highly useful in understanding female candidates, as many of them, although subscribing to some liberal notions, are not attempting to completely redo the existing electoral system in its entirety. So my anti-Orientalist remark is a defense of the achievement of women against hierarchical attitudes, West versus the rest, that trivialize these achievements. Um, and I don't mean necessarily all, um, you know, all women, uh, and it's actually this message is directly to some of the NGO women from the Western world coming to Mongolia and seeing what they want to see as opposed to seeing what is actually there. Since democratization, many women candidates, along with civil society and many other agents, including the international agencies, have been pushing the electoral system to be more inclusive of women. This has been necessary because with the end of the socialist state, the 25% quota for women's seats in the National Assembly was jettisoned. <laughs> <laughs> was basically liquidated, right, along with other programs and policies that helped to involve women in government. That just disappeared. Since 2006, new legislation restoring the candidate quota, it's not a seat quota, it's a candidate quota, has had a turbulent history. It was passed in 2006, then repealed by the parliament before the 2008 elections. It was passed again with amendments in 2012, then yet another version was passed before the 2006 election, 16 elections. Many political dramas took place in this short time. But most pertinent to our discussion is the repeal of the quota before the 2008 election, which took place at the end of 2007. This is important because from that moment on, women candidates realized that could, they could no longer depend on a formal legalized system-based platform. They could rely little on their political parties too. Overall, it was the moment of realization, as one woman politician told me, that individual women were on their own. With the proliferation and privatization of campaigns, it also meant that the financial requirements were higher than before. Among many rumored reasons behind the repeal of the quota, rhetoric about, quote, a lack of prepared women, end of quote, was perhaps most prominent. This rhetoric was also an impetus for the women candidates whom I met starting in 2006 to become so-called prepared. When I inquired what prepared meant, hardly anyone could give me a concrete answer. 
Preparedness was elusive, open-ended, and it vaguely meant to present a credible politician who was simply undeniable. It was becoming clear to me that the domain of electionization in today's Mongolia has become a space for inventing and negotiating additional gendered and classed attributes. While most people could not adequately, adequately explain what prepared meant, I have observed that women candidates were busily preparing themselves on their own. They were structuring their personal lives around the competition for parliamentary seats. In addition to all official expected preparations of their campaigns, like you know, getting your team, honing your message, preparing your speech, uh, securing fundings and things like that, many of these women were engaged in long-term programs of self-improvement, self-renovation, self-development, and self-polishing in order to become electable candidates. Their activities were aligned with, coincidentally, with theories of neoliberal self-making. Many scholars have written and theorized about neoliberal selves. Following the insights of Foucault, Bourdieu, Nicholas Rose, and others, anthropologist Carla Freeman, who studies the new middle and upper middle classes in the Caribbean, writes that, quote, the self as an entrepreneurial project and the constant renovation is a key signpost of neoliberalism and its perpetual quest for flexibility in the changing global marketplace. End of quote. More to quote from Freeman. Entrepreneurial self-making is always work in formation, akin to the processual work of class, gender, race, and culture. End of quote. Freeman's notion of the self as an entrepreneurial project under constant renovation, echoes the ways in which the women parliamentary candidates in Mongolia thought about themselves. But only in a general sense. Understandably, both the substance of the renovation and its intended result can differ according to the context and the goals of individual women. From polishing their physical appearances and, as one aspiring candidate put it, quote, sharpening their minds, end of quote, to enhancing their charisma, these were long-term self-cultivating activities that were meant to create an electable persona. These were the Mongolian middle and upper middle class versions of the selves discussed in various literatures on neoliberal selves, flexible, entrepreneurial, and who treated themselves as ongoing projects. In this talk, I attend to two types of preparatory activities. One, self-cultivation of what I call an intellectual persona, and self-polishing into an attractive femininity. The fact that elections shape gendered cells is a part of its governing function. In this case, the governing goes beyond managing the resources, the population and its crisis, but also shaping the bodies and minds. Both the self-cultivation of an intellectual persona and self-polishing of beautiful feminine selves have roots in the past and in the present. Women strive to be comprehensive in their self-preparation to achieve the most perfect selves that they can. In doing so, they must navigate vague, multiple, and contradictory understanding, understandings of electable candidates and of proper womanhood. Examining women's self-cultivating and self-polishing practices reveals that gender, even in a relatively homogeneous society such as Mongolia, is constantly in flux and under negotiation. Among the Mongolian voters, the criteria such as ayundlag, which refers to an educated professional who also upholds the moral and ethical values associated with public intellectuals is highly important, at least in rhetoric. I translate Ayunlik as intellectful because the Mongolian word literally means with intellect and not intelligentsia in terms of social class. The Mongolian electorate ranks education as the number one criteria for voting for a female member of parliament. In many voter outreach meetings, I heard the electorate speak up that it was necessary to elect Ayunluk 
intellectual people, and especially from Sihating Institute, meaning women intellectuals, intelligentsia. The political parties, however, do not automatically see intellectualness as an asset in itself. Much more important are candidates' resources, including skills and knowledge that can be useful for the party, or general prestige and reputation among voters, which might be, although not always, associated with the women's branding as intellectual. Against these highly utilitarian measurements, as well as patriarchal views of women as super secretaries or stepping stones for their male colleagues within the hierarchical structures of the political parties, women candidates have cultivated and propagated themselves as intellectual by earning masters, PhDs, and various certificates from high prof profile international institutions, including Stanford, Yale, Harvard, and other. learning foreign languages and gaining high positions in their respected professions. Let me give you an example of a parliamentary candidate, perhaps one of the most, one of the most well known, Ms. Ayungir. In 2006, Ayungir arrived at Yale University's World Fellow Program, which prepares public and business leaders. As a strategy for gaining popularity back home, she was instructed by the program to write a book, a combination of a memoir and platform statement. Oyungra's first book, entitled Notes on My Study in America, narrates her experience in being accepted to universities in the US and shares advice on finding scholarships. Though well received, the book's readership was limited to students mostly in the city of Olambata. It was not helpful in gaining votes in rural Hufskut province, where she planned on competing. In order to attract voters in Hufskut, Ayungaril wrote a second book, entitled Nomadic Dialogues. It is a dialogue dictionary for English-speaking tourists and for Mongolian families hosting the tourists. The book became a bestseller but did not garner enough fame to enhance her candidacy, according to Ayungaril herself. By 2007, Ayungaril had finished her third book, titled The Green-Eyed Lama. Written over the period of 10 years, the book brought her fame and a substantial amount of money to aid her electoral campaign. The novel was based on Mongolia's political violence of the 1930s and its long-term implications on, for Ayungaril's family and the community that surrounds Dainder, the monastery in Hofskut province. The 523-page novel was a bestseller for a number of years since its publication in 2008. Because the state suppressed memories of state violence, the book meets an urge to learn about the past. But there are many other reasons why the book sold so well, and we can talk about it if there is a time left. She wrote many other books, but the idea is that she sort of remade herself as an author by going from one genre to the next. Through authorship, Ayungaril gained nationwide recognition without paying any money to journalists and producers, but by making some instead. She became a celebrity who was not a beauty queen or a trophy wife, but by being Ayun Luk, intellectual. Unlike the intellectual class, Ayun Luk emphasizes a person's moral values and capacities without an indication of class membership. By choosing to write a novel that unearthed history suppressed under socialism, Ayungil displayed herself as a new intellectual of the democratic period. The socialist state's patronage and ideological impositions would no longer dictate her choices. Ayungil's voice became that of an artistic and creative author, but also unofficial visionary, as the book proved to be bigger and more influential than her voice as a politician. For example, her protest against the repeal of the 30% quarter in 2007 had no impact. Since con um, she convinced her party to nominate her as a candidate based on the fame that she gained, not only as a politician, but primarily as an author, the, there is a complicated scheme where the parties assess the uh, future candidates' um, platform um, by sending um, 
you know, researchers and doing the surveys. And if the survey shows that, you know, the candidate has, um, is likely to gain votes, then they nominate. So it's like, it's a circle. It goes, it's difficult. It's like the person has to do both, the chicken and the egg. It is notable that Ayungarul wrote her novel as a fiction writer, unlike other politicians, both male and female, who write polemical columns and editorials defending or strengthening their political positions. Many politicians, mostly male, have written memoirs explaining their moral and political views, essays about current political, politics and economy, and books explaining the personal and professional programs of their intended leadership. Ayun Giril's novel carried out the quests of democratic revolution of the early 1990s while also questioning in all too often absent history of past violence. But unlike direct political attacks against the then MPRP, Mongolian People's Revolutionary Party, she used a subtle work of art which was a more intellectual than a political way of presenting one's opinions. Of course, literature writing is only one way and the most direct and visible way of presenting one's intellectualness. There are many other ways as well as displays of being intellectual that I could have discussed here. For instance, some candidates include photographs, of their campaign, uh, photographs in their campaign brochure that feature their artistic and academic achievements from their childhood or feature photographs with their family members or friends who are well-known senior intellectuals. There are also more subtle, less visible, situated and more nuanced ways of being intellectual, such as seeing inconsistencies and loopholes in laws and decrees, an ability to measure and predict risks, win a difficult lawsuit, and deter attacks and accusations during a voter outreach campaign meetings. Mongolians associate, associate acts of these kinds with Tarang Huan, literally translates silken intelligence, and they are more suited for explore, exploration in a longer written version than in this talk. In addition to showing their educational and professional achievements, many women candidates also have to present beautiful feminine selves. Such expectations are frustrating to many women since they came to politics for reasons quite independent of their desire to fit a particular model of feminine identity. And yet elections prove to be highly discriminating against sloppy presentations and unkempt bodies. In Mongolia, attractive looks are no longer just a matter of inherited physical trait. Money, taste, knowledge about the most recent and powerful beauty products, fashion, salons, surgical and other techniques, and diets all shape the gendered and classed self. The importance of physical beauty and its democratization is a recent global phenomenon. Anthropologist Michael Tosik writes that in Colombia, beauty is both force and infrastructure and not mere ornament. Alexander Edmonds, working in Brazil, writes that beauty, now achievable through plastic surgery, is an asset that can help one move up the social and economic ladder. In the case of Japanese beauty practices, Laura Miller argues that beauty is a resource for enhancing self-confidence. As elsewhere, standards of beauty in Mongolia are fluid and inconsistent. But both the type and this extent of beautification have little, if any, limits. These open-endedness conditions most women who are striving for public acceptance and recognition to engage in ongoing self-polishing and self-perfecting activities. Beauty is not just another extra asset for success. One can hardly have too much of it, but one can be easily deficient of it. Beauty is a necessary attribute that reveals one's place in a social stratum, one's place in modernity and demonstration of not being left out in the outdated elsewhere within a hierarchical structure of time which is also related to power. 
Women candidates, like all other women, are immersed in a new, previously unavailable, commoditized and sexualized femininity, but they must navigate an environment of male politicians, invasive media and the critical electorate. These women candidates strive to achieve a particular femininity that set them apart from beauty queens and trophy wives, one that commands attention and respect. For that, women politicians' self-styling is a form of censorship meant to present an ideal feminine political subject. They use style to resist the oppressive order, but not by symbolically breaking the rules and instituting their individual identity, but by protecting their sexualities through what are considered to be dignified styles and status-making accessories. In making themselves political subjects, they use bureaucratized and corporate styles of suits and dresses. Most Mongolian women candidates wear Western-style power suits. British suit or Chanel inspired ones. Their suits are mostly perfectly tailored and buttoned up, complete with formal jewelry sets and high or mid heel pumps. These are not just coveted items that project wealth and globally recognizable status. Through them, the women also command respect in order to keep denigration at bay, to convey equal status with men, and to, protect, and to project glamour, but without any explicit incitements. Roland Barthes writes that, quote, the men's suit and the women's suit by Chanel have one ideal in common, distinction. In the 19th century, distinction was a social value. In a society which had recently been democratized and in which men from the upper classes were not, not now permitted to advertise their wealth, but which their wives were allow, allowed to do for them by proxy. It allowed them to distinguish themselves all the same by using a discrete detail. The Chanel style picks up on this historical heritage in a filtered, feminized way. End of quote. Bartha's idea explains the dress code not only of women politicians, but also of anyone trying to set its, herself apart from the crowd in a society that is reconfiguring its social stratification. Quite plainly, the political and bureaucratic style has not changed from socialism when intellectuals, professors, state servants, and political cadres also wore business style suits in order to distinguish themselves from herders and workers. Roland Barthes' further comments also speak to the female candidates striving to distinguish themselves as intellectual and as politically elite, as apart from the novel riche. Quote, of all the fashions, Chanel style is the most social because what it fights, what it rejects, are the vulgarities of petty bourgeois clothing. So it is in societies confronted with a newly arisen need for aesthetic self-promotion in Moscow, where she goes, that Chanel has the best chance of being the most successful. End of quote. The power suit was also accompanied by other relevant and complementing features. For instance, during her term as a Yale World Fellow, Ayungirin received consultations on presenting an appropriate image as a political candidate. She cut her long braids into a contemporary bob and toned down her makeup to appear more natural and minimal, although she kept brighter lipstick, better suiting Mongolian tastes. She was instructed to wear clothes of a uniform style in order to be easily recognizable to the voters. She chose to wear mostly white or pale colored button down shirts with darker business suits and matching shoes and briefcase. She created a sleek and streamlined image. She also had her campaign picture taken in a professional photo studio that served high profile politicians including Hillary Clinton. There, she also received instructions on smiling and posing. But Ayungiril transformed herself beyond her exteriors as well. She was told that her voice, one of the most important tools of a politician, and I love this part because this like, transformation of the body goes much beyond the self-styling. Uh, one of the most important tools of a politician was too thin, and high-pitched, and thus not suitable for prolonged and pleasant listening. 
She took lessons from professional singers and practiced to speak in low, substantive, and thick voice that was also authoritative and charismatic. It took her two years of continuous practice to acquire the kind of voice that she considered appropriate for a politician. Indeed, it was after hearing about Oyungiril's voice, after she explained to me her training, that I understood the mysterious shifts in her voice. To her assistants, Oyungiril spoke in a thicker and somewhat monotonous tone, whereas to me, she spoke in a higher pitched and more dynamic tone, which I believe was her more natural non-politician's voice. While most women wear Western-style power suits, some choose to wear the Mongolian traditional deal. As another well-known woman candidate named Zana illustrated to me, the traditional deal can be used to underscore a candidate's adherence to public ideas about proper femininity. One of the first feminist and activist politicians in the contemporary era, Zana ran as an independent during 2008 and uh, from the civil movement party in 2012 election. She chose to wear a dale made of silk and a long flowing scarf that draped over her shoulder all the way down to her ankles. In urban Mongolia, Zana is the one in the white tail and with uh, lavender shawl in this one. In urban Mongolia, these are not worn as regularly as in the countryside. Most women in urban areas, especially educated middle-class women, wear Western-style clothing on a regular basis. They wear days occasionally, usually only for special events, such as award ceremonies, national holidays, or when invited to give speeches to large audiences. Shawls are not a part of the day, and actually they're not Mongolian, and not traditional piece of clothing. Thus, Zana's deal and the shawl were new and unexpected, adding to her noticeability in a way that her Western-style clothes, although very fashionable, hers especially, never would have. In Western clothes, Zana would have blended into the urban crowd, but during the election in 2008, 2012, and in 2016, one could spot Zana's flowing silk shawl in various parts of Ulaanbaatar, especially because the length of the flowing shawl, not this one, but she had other ones, extended her dramatic presence as she walked through the space. Once I was inside a car with another female candidate waiting for the traffic light. Actually, there is another picture of her. So in this, this, this one is, um, so she's wearing a different attire. But it's all consistent. She has all colors of the, the same sort of recognizable outfit. Once I was inside a car with another female candidate waiting for the traffic light. Zana crossed the street in her bright blue, blue deal and wide-brimmed hat with her almost transparent also blue shawl, floating gently a few feet behind her. The candidate with whom I rode in the car knew Zana well and told me that a well-known oracle, oracle being a person who foretells the future or connects with the higher power, oracle being someone whom people go to consult for insight, had suggested that the out, uh, that outfit to her. Although the oracle suggested deals and shawls to Zana, according to my interlocutor. To another woman, he advised sharp business suits worn over light shirts. When I inquired what the oracle was trying to suggest, my interlocutor explained to me that the oracle was tailoring these women's images to make them noticeable and acceptable to the public. Apparently, the candidate to whom the oracle suggested sharp, dark business suits was soft-spoken, quiet, and modest. So she, by suggesting that she wear Western-style dark suits, he was sharpening her image, making her appear powerful and persuasive. It was meant to give force, I was told. The situation was different for Zana, hence the outfit of a deal with a shawl. Zana was a feminist, an activist, and one of the leaders of the civil society in Mongolia. She was uncompromising and direct in her claims, and she usually never shied away from critiquing male chauvinism, corruption, and other wrongdoings. 
Some people found her utterly intimidating. Others found her too direct and thus uncomfortable to be around. But most found her full of charisma. I attended several women's meetings of different political parties. Whenever a discussion arose about female candidacy, women mentioned that some very charismatic women from civil society, such as Zana, were powerful competitors who diminished their chances of winning. Zana's daily show enhanced her existing charisma and added other characteristics that Western-style clothing could not. Zana began her political career in civil society by building coalitions as feminist and advocate for gender equality. When she introduced the concept of gender equality in the early 1990s, it was misunderstood as a call for women to fight to become barga, bosses. Because both gender and feminism are largely seen as Euro-American concepts, Zana was associated with Western values more than with Mongolian ones. More. In Mongolia, the word gender tends to conflate with the word feminism, unlike in the U.S. where gender tends to conflict, conflate with the word sex. As a young woman in rural Mongolia noted to me, going back to the fact that she's, you know, you're, you're internationally influenced, many, uh, as noted to me, many urban or Western-influenced candidates do not seem to, quote, descend on the Mongolian soil, end of quote. They are removed, which means hundi. And that is their problem. It was not clear to me if the oracle who consulted Zana saw her as not quite fitting the Mongolian soil. But the suggestion to wear a Mongolian deal throughout the election campaign was definitely a reminder to the populace that Zana was indeed embedded in the country's soil and traditions. Moreover, with a distinctly feminine accessory like a shawl, whereas a deal is more gender neutral, the oracle intended to soften her image and make her appear less harsh. The shawl enhanced Zana's femininity, but without any invitation to intimacy, since it was worn over the deal, which usually covers the entire body. And while the shawl extended Zana's presence in physical terms, it did so without the body. The long flowing silk was there to represent Zana, but it was not just her body. Of course, with Dale and Scholl, Zana was not remade completely anew. She was still the internationally acknowledged cosmopolitan feminist and westernized urban lady, but with softened aura, as the oracle expected. Thus, the flowing shawl, the memorable accessories, the power suits, briefcases, and the Dale, worn in specific context and by distinct individuals, all comprise important tools for self-styling that tend to increase charisma and power and show the work of self-polishing and self-renovation to meet the open-ended requirements for political candidacy. In this talk, I have described electionization as a framework for further understanding Mongolia's social political life in the neoliberal era. I have argued that elections have turned into all-encompassing ad hoc governing mechanisms that often take over some of the functions of the state. Electionization structures Mongolia's social, emotional, and economic life. It contributes to the existing neoliberal circumstances that shape flexible, entrepreneurial, open-ended subjects who live a life of a constant renovation of self. With electionization, such transformations of self are also politicized. By highlighting examples of women parliamentary candidates, highly strategic self-cultivation into intellectual, intellectual selves and self-polishing in order to gain respectable femininity in the political arena, I have given a glimpse into the ways in which electionization also contributes to the transformation of gender and gendered subjects and subjectivities. Shifting away from the new upper class culture of trophy wives, beauty pageants, and fashion models, as well as the looks and lifestyles that are based on conspicuous consumption, these female, female candidates shape subtly different femininity, femininities that speak to the multiplicity of neoliberal selves, achievements, and self-making. Thank you.